because you have become what everybody else here has become. Marching to the beat of the American dream drum, except for you fail to realize it's in America where people commit suicide. It's in America where people pop pills to get through life. Is that home where no one's ever home? Is that ring or vacation or the opinion of that other dissatisfied family really what makes you wake up? every single motherfucking day and go to that job that you hate and I'm crazy? Well, crazy is what crazy does and this crazy thinks that I can love. Ignorance, hurt, and hate away and the way that I live day to day, I am gonna dance the world sadness away. Salsa. Or at least I'll put a smile on your face. Standing like a fool in the middle of the street I sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Bop, bop, bop. This little light of mine, I've got to let it shine. I am going to break in and liberate you from the chains that our culture has taught you to wear so well. What if one by one we let our Berlin walls crash down and we walked around with our frowns turned the other way around and we looked into each other's eyes? To see the fire that burns inside, we are not enemies. We are not different political parties. We are not our parents' armies. We are humanity. Thank you. Thank you for short. So I like to share that poem first because um, it's more interesting than just saying hi. No, <laughs> no, but that's how I started the organization, I, and it tells a little bit about my story. I, so I grew up in this town. It, it was this really beautiful neighborhood, super, it's, it's suburban. I mean, to be honest, it was a suburban white neighborhood, but it was very wealthy, very protected. And my family was on welfare, and we struggled, and I felt like everybody in the whole world was rich, and my family was poor, and I was mad at the world. How could you give me this life? And like she said in my bio, I ended up realizing that going on this trip, I made a sign that said, send Katie to Haiti. And my youth group was doing all this community service, and they were going to do some service in Haiti. I don't know how I feel about those trips, not endorsing them or anything, but I went on one, and it did change my life. I realized that I am one of the world's wealthiest people, and even though I grew up in poverty, and what was I going to do about it? You know, the people I was meeting didn't have, back, um, they didn't have a access to some of their basic human rights. And I was like, wow, this whole time I thought I was poor. You know, I thought I was just the one struggling. But, you know, the major I learned 88% of the world is, you know, lives in places where they struggle. And I wanted to know, you know, I'm like, what am I going to do about it? I always wanted people to help me. Um, so I end up getting this job similar to Peace Corps and uh, like a program like that. And I, I'm 23 years old, right out of college, literally my first job out of college. And, and they send me and they say, you're going to Liberia. And... To be honest, I didn't know a lot about Liberia. I don't know if I missed that day in high school when we were supposed to, why aren't we learning about this country? It was formed by freed American slaves and has this connection to the United States. Liberia actually means liberty. They have a US flag with one star instead of 50. They have cities, they, they have a place called, I, I work in a school now in New Orleans and uh, Louisiana, they have a place, or in Louisiana, they have, a, they have Maryland and Virginia as states, they call them counties. Um, so it's a really, I mean, Monrovia is named after our fifth president, James Monroe, all these interesting things. So, but it also had, if you've seen the movie Blood Diamond many years ago, I mean, people know Sierra Leone had this war, but Liberia also was a part of that same civil war that went on for 14 years and destroyed the infrastructure of the country. It was one of the most brutal civil wars that has taken place in our lifetime. Um, and, you know, I, I show up, and it's this beautiful place. I mean, the vibrant, and people, the songs that people will sing, and, um, and it was really, you know, had moved me. It was my first time in, you know, on the continent, but it was, um, I mean, I was running adult literacy programs in, remote, in the remote village called uh, Korya, and I'd come from the village. To be honest, I'm just keeping it real. I keep it real all the time. You'll have questions later. I don't know how to be any other way, but I didn't really like, I wasn't getting used to the bush meat. Like the food in the rural village was not my thing. And uh, I was trying really hard. Now I, I like, like I'm obsessed with Liberian food, but at the time I didn't. So I'd come to the city as much as I could, probably like once a month, and I would get pizza. Like we have here. <laughs> I wanted pizza. So when I was there, I'd meet all these kids outside of the pizza place. 
And a lot of them were asking, they were selling, um, you know, they had buckets on their head, selling water. They were polishing shoes and doing all this work. And I'm a big kid, so I made, I'm like, what are these kids up to? So I made friends with them, and we started hanging out and playing, and we're like drawing donkeys in the sand. It's on the beach. It's like such a beautiful place. I'm throwing kids in the ocean. They become my friends, and I'm like, if you could have anything in the whole world, what would it be? And, uh, you know, they said over and over and over again, we're like, we really just want to go to school. That's it. And, uh, and I was like, geez, like, how much does that cost? And at the time, it was no free school in the country. Um, the government has made school officially free, but doesn't have uh, the funding to really make it free. So it's still not free. And that, we can talk about that in the question and answers if you want to know more. Um, so I ended up using, I paid uh, some school fees, but then ended up using social media to help tell some of the stories to my friends and family in my community and say, will you help me? I put a couple girls in school, kids in school. Uh, originally, it was boys and girls. Uh, and then I ended up realizing that the girls were mo more vulnerable than the boys. So um, started focusing on girls and used MySpace, which was cool back in the day. And uh, <laughs> I've been on, and now it's Instagram. But we've been, we've been, you know, people were wiring me money to Liberia. And this New York City tax attorney, she was like, you know, you should really make this a legitimate organization. Give people a tax write-off and track the funding and all this stuff. And I remember just feeling like a few things, you know, why we don't need another organization in the world. Um, and then just lots of things in them. But the main one I was feeling was, who am I to start anything? I am not this Ivy League girl. I didn't get my master's degree. And all these other NGO, non-government organization and other people that I was meeting in this international field had degrees like Sophia. And uh, I, didn't, I studied culture and religion. Like I, I'm like, I'm not qualified. And I got the best advice I've ever gotten in my life. Uh, one of my good friends said, get over yourself. It's not about you. And I played that in my head over and over again. It's not about you. It's not about you. I still have to play that over in my head. Uh, my fiance, Teddy, who's here, tells me that all the time now, too. Um, what's up? <laughs> There's Teddy. Um, so I named the organization More Than Me. And we ended up, uh, the president of Liberia got involved. She's the first female president in Africa. And she's heard that I was helping girls go to school. So I sat with her. And she, you know, she was really thankful. You know, she, she, I tried to make her laugh, and she wasn't laughing. And uh, she's not, she's very presidential. She just, that's not her style. And then, uh, you know, I'm like trying to give her a hug, and she's not really hugging me. I'm like, this is awkward. And, uh, and then I started speaking Pele. Yatwae, kumanichu, ilava based on the local language. Then I made her laugh. So then we were, I was like, okay, we're good. And, <laughs> and she said to me, as long as you're serving the children of Liberia, you know, thank you so much. As long as you're serving them for free, you can use one of our government buildings because we're not using them because the war destroyed so much of us. So here you go, and you can have this building for free. And it uh, gives me this building, and I'm like, well, thank you so much, President Turley. What are you going to say no to the president? And, uh, and, you know, so I was like, well, what am I going to do? And at the time, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't sell enough eggs to fix this thing up. So I <laughs> no one laughed at that. It's funny. That's funny. No, I was throwing events in, in our hometown where Sophia is from, and, uh, and, and, and things were getting bigger, but I needed a few hundred thousand dollars to fix this thing up. So I ended up using, again, social media, and Chase Bank heard about what I was doing. I ended up in one of those contests. I don't know if they're still going on. I, I haven't seen them in a while, but it was like, if you like this page, you will win a million dollars. And everyone else is like, really? I don't believe that. Well, let me tell you something. I ended up on primetime national television in a competition with 24 other organizations competing for a million dollars. Our budget at the time was less than $250,000. I had a $5,000 marketing budget. I was up against organizations with $10 million budgets. And we, we, made, we ran a campaign called I Am Abigail around a little girl involved in sex work. It went viral online. And I ended up winning a million dollars. And uh, our organization did, not me. And then, obviously, this is Joe McCall, who is a comedian. I don't know who famous people are either. I'm, like, so bad at that. Hootie and the Blowfish, like, picked me up and, like, spinning me around. Like, Miss Universe is like, can I write I Am Abigail on my forehead? I'm like, where am I? What is this? And Joe McCall's like, you should have a career in screaming. So it was that, that was kind of the, the beginning of really being able to become a legitimate organization in some senses because you can hire people. And, um, and I didn't have to do any more medical studies. So we opened up the first all-girls, free all-girls uh, academy after the war in Liberia. And it was, the one of, it was the best day of my life. It was the president came, my mother, who's like never left New Jersey, flew in, you know, to Africa. It was like unbelievable. We're all there. My girls were singing and performing dance in front of the president. And it literally was the best day of my life. It was my birthday. 
uh, my 31st birthday, so it was three years ago. And, uh, and we opened the school, and it was really exciting. And there's the president. We're cutting the red ribbon with the U.S. ambassador. Everybody came. And, but it's not just a school. It's like we provide every barrier that a girl faces to receiving an education. So we have two meals a day. We have technology and trained teachers and after-school programs. And um, there's health center. And there's health. not only do we have a health center at our school, we also have health insurance. And everything that you can imagine, the girls were leaping forward two grade levels at a time. Super exciting. Like the early results were showing. It was like the, becoming the number one school in the country. Now it's been years and we can tell you that we have the highest in math. We're fourth in literacy, so we're working on that in central Monrovia. So exciting. I was like, oh my god, this is the best. Here we go. The momentum, the momentum. And then Ebola hits. And I'm like, well, what the heck is that? You know, like I Google Ebola and I like I hear, you know, you hear all these things in this movie, and but now Ebola is in went from like remote Liberia and it came into the center of the city. And as you can see, this some of these were actually. Um, this little boy here on the bucket is named Saw, and he lives in the community where my girls are from. And I was in the U.S. for, um, for a board meeting, and I remember tell, I, I, when I saw that, I'm like, it's reached to West Point. I'm calling my team in West Point. I, you know, we have a, a sta like a, you know, I'm calling my staff. I'm calling the families and my friends, and they're like, some people are like, oh, it's totally fine. We're okay. It's not, a bull is not really real. The government made it up to make money. Other people are like, it's wartime and we're going to die. And there's, you know, like, I couldn't get a clear answer of what was going on on the ground. So I told my team I have to go back. So I go back. I get 15 things of medical supplies. And, um, and, and they're like, and I end up going into West Point, which is, West Point is an area where our students live. It's the largest slum in West Africa. And obviously it's a, an area where Ebola can really grow because there's, you know, people are living very congested. There's no s proper sanitation. There's no bathrooms. Um, public restrooms are out on the beaches. So uh, I, went to, I went to Doctors Without Borders, who that, that was like the main organization I knew that was active. And I said, can you train me and my team? Like, we, you know, we, I need to keep, we have to keep safe. And so I call the community. You know, the community is meeting, and they're very active. But I go into the community where our students live, and you see the women's groups that are meeting with the, um, with the elders and the Muslim group and the Christian group, and everyone's coming together, and they've organized themselves really well, but, um, but they don't have any resources. So I'm like, well, what's the problem? And they say, Katie, we call for an ambulance, and the ambulance doesn't come for four days. And, uh, and so by the time the ambulance gets there, the whole family is now has Ebola, and so we need an ambulance. So I, I called some donors, and we, had, we got an ambulance. And like, let's do this. So we need, I said, if I get the ambulance, the community needs to provide, you know, drivers and people, and we'll get them trained. So we worked together and supported the community. A lot of the fathers of my students volunteered to be the ambulance attendants. This is in the school. WHO is doing a training, World Health Organization, in front of our girls' artwork. This is, like, unbelievable looking at this. Um, I always get emotional when I talk about Ebola. And for our work, I mean, it was, we... It was, it was definitely, I, I'll never experience, I hope to God I never have to experience anything like that. I, I usually, I think I actually have a lot of time here. I do poetry. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to do another poem on that. I'll, I'll share a more hopeful poem at the end. But a lot of people died. We, we saved a lot of lives. But there was, there's a few stories, a little girl, um, I'll show you in a second, uh, named Sarah, who I gave her two teddy bears and some water. And I, she's 10 years old. And I'm like, you're going to be so fine. You're so strong. Look at you. Like, what am I supposed to tell her? She's, you know what I mean? I'm saying everything I can to make her feel better. She's walking into the treatment unit, and she never came back out. And I gave her a phone. We're texting her. Her mom's texting her, calling her. Her mom's calling her. And she stopped answering. So Sarah dies. There's a little boy named Charlie who's laying on the ground outside of the treatment unit with his pants down. And he's, like, surrounded in blood and diarrhea and by himself. And his own family is not around. He can't speak. So I'm just, I'm singing to, I mean, we had a rule, like, A to Z, what to do when people were dying. And, like, the last piece of it was, like, when there's nothing left you can do, sing and bring dignity and death. So we end up, like, singing to people as they're dying. So for our work, mostly around the orphans, got a lot of attention. My Instagram became international news because no one was telling real, like, human stories. But I was using Instagram the whole time. And um, we were named, I was named Time Person of the Year. This little girl, Esther, um, I met her next to all the papers that were writing about it. Were they, those were the only international people I saw on the front lines. 
besides Doctors Without Borders, who had a, a hospital that originally could only fit 25 people. But I'm like, there's thousands of people with Ebola, and there's a hospital with 25 people. Like, what, what's, where are the people? Where is everybody? That, you know, and then like on the news, you're like, a billion pounds of medical supplies have landed in West Africa. And I'm like, and I'm on the front lines of Ebola, and I don't see any of that. The ambulance drivers and all these people, they, the main doctor, Dr. Brown, who's on the cover, this guy on the cover, I was bringing him selenium and different drugs that he was saying was, you know, helping him with keeping people alive. He, 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 he had, at one point, he was using plastic bags as gloves, and, for, and I'm like, where are all these things, and what is the problem, and, um, you know, anyway, so this little girl, I go, I show up at Dr. Brown's, um, he would have survival, he had a little hospital that was run, he ran it, and, uh, and I said, Dr. Brown, why all the people who would come in our ambulance wanted to go to his hospital rather than to go to the other one that had more support? And I said, why does everybody want to go here? And they're like, well, the survival, the survival rates are, are bigger. And I said, Dr. Brown, what's your, what, what's your, how is everybody surviving? Why, is you, why are your rates higher? And he goes, it's selenium. It's like this vitamin. So I'm like getting vitamins. Like, I think, you know, Sophia's mom and everyone in my hometown are like driving around the United States, like buying all the selenium everywhere they can and like overnighting them. And I bring them to Dr. Brown. And I said, here you go, Dr. Brown. And there's people all around and they're singing. And I'm, I'm like, what is this? And he goes, it's a survival ceremony. And there's this one little girl, Esther, and she's there, and she's got her head down, and she's bawling. And, uh, and I was like, well, why is she crying? And, and they said, well, she's the only one in her family that survived. And, um, and they're about to be released. Everyone's about to be released, and there's no one to pick her up. And I'm like, well, where are you releasing her to? And they said, we don't know. And uh, or, there's no orphan, you know, there's no, they don't have systems like we have here for that. So we ended up taking her, and we found some families. Uh, we ended up finding a, an extended cousin that she's living with now, and she goes to the More Than Me Academy. But um, afterwards, after the whole thing, we knew this is Charlie and, uh, and Sarah. But afterwards, I mean, I went back after, you know, six months on the front lines. I was a mess. I'm still, anytime I think about it, I'm a wreck. I never want to be the same person again. I want to be, I want to remember. I want to feel what I felt. And... Um, and I, I, I was thinking about it, I was like, the reason why Ebola had the toll that it did is because of the broken systems. We all know that. There's broken systems in Africa. It's, uh, you know, aid has failed. You know, the government, both local government and U.S. government, which is supposed to be a friend to Liberia, we failed. The organ NGOs that were supposed to be helping the international organizations getting all this attention were in meetings oftentimes, not calling out every single one. I'm sure there's some good ones there. And, uh, and we worked with some and we teamed up with some. But the people that were really fighting and ending Ebola that didn't get a lot of attention around this were the local people. They were the people in the communities. And the reason why that they, you know, that Ebola had the toll that it did is because they didn't have the resources they needed and there weren't the systems in place. So when you come back to the root cause of child prostitution, which we often work with, and a lot of our students are, unfortunately, have been exploited in that way, um, and, and when you look at Ebola, the reason why the toll, the, the root re reason is because of there's no education system. You cannot build a healthcare system. You can't, buy, you know, roads and all these other things. And everybody building these systems is coming from somewhere else. And as soon as war or as soon as Ebola or as soon as any dangerous thing happens, they leave. And the people are left and they haven't been trained. They don't have, and they, they, they want to fight. And no one will fight harder for them than themselves. So I said, I went to the Ministry of Education and I said, this is Minister Warner, the head of education, who's become one of my close friends. I said, Minister Warner, what is your plan to rebuild the education system? And how can I be a part of it? And he said, Katie, can you, you know, and as we all, like these are, there's a zillion statistics of how the education system has failed. I mean, I don't, Liberia is one of the poorest countries in the world. Like it, it's obvious that I don't have to paint that, but this, one of my board members in Liberia, um, he administered this test for entrance to university, and 100% of people failed. And, um, and so, you know, I'm like, why did they all fail, Dorbo? And he said, because I refused to take any bribes from anybody. He had people calling him from everywhere saying, please help my brother, help my sister. You know, everybody was saying, please help them pass, and people usually pay to get, that's how people pass through school. They, they pay to get to the next level. And he refused to take any money. He's called the incorruptible man. And, uh, and so 100% of people failed. And it's just obvious, no, he's like, no one can read in the country. Like, the only people that really know how to read and critically think, uh, the majority of those people receive their education from outside of Liberia. 
even the refugees who've returned, they got their education in Ghana or Sierra Leone or neighboring countries, many of them in the United States. Um, and so we went and, and he said, can you help me? Can you take what you've done at More Than Me Academy and create model schools in the counties? And I said, let's go for it. So we ended up um, taking a look at, at the current conditions of school around the country. I've lived there long enough, I already knew, but let's go talk to the people, talk to the students, talk to the ministers, administrators, talk to the you know, teachers and find out what's happening and basically came back to find out that there, there really wasn't any education happening. I mean, the people were trying, but there were no chalkboards, there was no chalk, there, was no, there weren't any materials and the kids had you know, notebooks and they're trying to share in the rain, they're walking to school with notebooks with no umbrellas and they've got bananas on their, banana um, leaves on their heads to try to keep their books warm, you know, dry. And this is the, you know, those teachers don't show up because no one is, um, no one, there's no, there's a few teachers that are coming, but they have nobody, you know, there's no accountability. So if they come or they don't come, they, if they're on payroll, they get paid. And you ask the government, well, why aren't you checking to make sure the teachers are coming? And they're like, well, we don't have any money to go and check because there's no gas in the car and there's no, and then the car, motorbike is broken and there's like a zillion reasons. So we, you know, the minister himself said there's no education happening. The president said the, edu let's t the education system is a mess. Um, so what has come from that is basically the largest education reform that's ever taken place in an entire nation. It's called Partnership Schools for Liberia, and it's where a partner like More Than Me manages a government school. Similar here to charter schools, it's not as political as the charter school system uh, because it's ev all the schools will be charter schools is the idea, not just some. Um, and I think we're, it's just like a very different context of what's happening. Um, so that's, what's, that's what we've been working on. And, uh, <laughs> and so I just got back, I was spending, I leave tomorrow. Uh, we go, we're trying to, Teddy is working on health in schools with, um, you know, with a, another doctor over there. And, uh, and we're trying to deliver basic um, safety, health, and quality education to every single school and every single child. They're basic human rights. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we're not stopping until it happens. And we have a, this huge vision that, it, you know, there's, you, it, they always say it's impossible. They're like, it's impossible to start an organization. It's impossible to fix that school. It's impossible to fight Ebola and not get Ebola. You're going to die. Not one of our staff died during Ebola. I didn't die. We're all here, thank God. And, um, and I always say, and Nelson Mandela said it best. He said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So I say, let's go do it. You know, <laughs> no one's ever done it before. So we're... We're on a mission to go do that, and uh, I know that I have more time, but I want to do, um, I'm going to do one more poem, and then I'm going to open it up for some uh, questions and answers. Um, okay, so this poem is called She Is My Promise, and it's written after Abigail, and I, I wrote it because I came back to the States. It's really strange. This life, like running this organization, I'm literally working with the world's poorest people, and I come back and raise money from the world's wealthiest people. And... I, like, sometimes I, like, I was just in Miami at this event. I couldn't believe, you know, some of the, anyway, I, I'm writing a book. I'm going to tell these stories. At the end, we're all humanity. That's it. We're all people, and, uh, and we all want the same things for our children. Um, so I wrote this because I was at a fundraiser for more than me when I first started the organization, and one of our students who was involved in sex work uh, went missing, and I was trying to tell her story to someone, and they pulled me aside from the party, and they said, can you soften the story? a little bit, it's really hard for people to swallow. And I was angry. I was like, are you kidding me? This little girl's missing and you want me to soften this? Like, what if your child was missing? You know what I mean? It wasn't even my child, but it's a friend of mine. So, uh, I, you know, I went back and I wrote this again on a uh, napkin. I, I'm, I have a thing with napkins and back and forth. So it's called She Is My Promise. So I am back on this bathroom floor again. And it's the middle of the night again. And flashes of your face keep me up again. It's you, Abigail. You have stained my soul. Is it a street worker? Is it a sex worker? You tell me, what is the politically correct way to say that my 11-year-old friend Abigail is a war orphaned prostitute? Yes, this $2 hooker, this child, she opens her legs to men so that she can stay alive. And right now, I'm not sure if she's alive. And when I think about her, I don't have the words to describe. My friend Abigail is missing. She is gone. She is nowhere to be found. And when I call her name, nobody knows her. Her community tells me matter-of-factly that she's vanished. Her country shushes me. It's not good for their reputation. My country tells me it's not polite to talk about her. 
Here she is the blame of a corrupt government in a country that people know nothing about. Here she is just another abstract thought that would never cross someone's mind on a line to purchase a cup of coffee that costs more than she would make selling herself for one day. Here she is just another Facebook cause that people might check they like because it's trendy or because it's easy. She is the bottom of the earth to a world that has been brutal to her, that has beat her up and raped her in ways that people who could read would never be able to pronounce. Now this small child is gone, and I've promised her that I would come and find her, and I can't. So I'm up again on this bathroom floor again, and it's the middle of the night again, and I need to scream her name. Abigail, where are you? I'm trying to find you. I haven't forgotten you. I am struggling to find words to talk about you. People here are offended by you, disturbed by you. I am too. You keep me up at night, and I hope that you always do. You are my vow, my promise. I'm coming to get you. So I, I want to open it up for questions, but I, I'm, I wanted to just end my talk by saying, you know, there's a lot, I guess in the world today, especially now, it feels like there's, you know, this heaviness, and maybe you don't, Sense. I mean, that's what I sense, especially in the United States and after a really hard year of election and election. But I feel like you find the thing you don't like and you do something about it. That there is nobody in the world coming to save our world. That's it. It's up to us. We are it. This is all we have. I think I never learned that more, uh, more so than during Ebola when we were sitting and waiting for the experts to come. We are the experts, we realize. There's nobody, <laughs> this is it. And there was a song that came from that with the community called I Am the Hero, You Are the Hero, We Are the Heroes that was birthed. And that was no one is going to fight harder for you, for your country, for your community, for your child, for the things that you believe in than you. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. And, and I ended up moving to Liberia 11 years ago and fell in love with the kids. And I'm joining with their community, with their country to, to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that basic, I believe in, before I'm an American, I'm a human being. And there's a, a beautiful connection between, I mean, a complicated connection, but there's beauty in it uh, with Liberia and the United States. And uh, I'm doing, we're working on everything we possibly can to ensure that every child has their basic human rights. If you're interested in learning more after this talk, the way that you can help, um, you can take out your phone. I know the internet's not good when everybody's on it, but <laughs> so I've heard what, you can email hi at morethanme.org and just say, here's my name. And uh, we can, we'll send some follow-up of how you can be involved. The second thing is we're doing this crazy thing that I'm, I like thinking big and being crazy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but the times that it does, it's been really amazing. And, uh, and the, we're doing, I want to do a viral campaign called Live for Five, and I want to fill news feeds with positive, uh, you know, with positivity and love and hope. And so I'm challenging all of you to go live for five minutes uh, on your Facebook feed, if you have Facebook, and talk about what makes you feel hopeful, and uh, to talk about living for something bigger than yourself, or, you know, something, people have just danced on it, they've done all kinds of things to bring beauty and hope uh, into, into our Facebook feeds. Um, tag live for five, um, and the whole idea is, I'm living for more than me by helping to rebuild the education system by joining with Liberia, and we hope um, we've raised money up th through it, and we're doing that to bring health care, basic health care for kids in Liberia. Um, but we just want to really promote that living for something bigger than yourself. Uh, Sophia just did it, and you can learn more about that by seeing our Facebook page um, where we are, have been sharing everybody's, and it's, it, it's fun to watch. It's scary, and people don't like to do it, uh, but that's the whole point is getting over yourself. Um, and the third thing is simple is, like, obviously you can give if you are interested in being a part of this in any way. We are doing... Uh, really, you know, we're going to do everything we can, and we're not stopping till it happens. Um, and we need your support. So if you if you can help through more than me, that would be great. So any questions? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Hafiz. I'm a public health major. Uh, thanks for coming. I really enjoyed your talk. So my question is how something I struggle with is like how do you use social media to advocate for the individuals that we often see as statistics, but at the same time not like 
normalize, I guess, the corruption because sometimes we see it so mm -hmm. much on our social media that it just kind of we kind of like accept it, become complacent about what's happening out there. I know. Yeah, that's something I struggle with too. She was saying, how do you use social media to be an advocate, but at the same time not like normalize what's happening. I, and I also struggle with like, I'm obviously white and I work in Africa, so that's strange sometimes too, talking about African children. Um, there's a lot of issues around using social media, but you wanna be an advocate. And um, I try my hardest, what I've done is, um, you know, we, we have a social media team on the ground in Liberia, one person that's helping to tell stories from there, from that end. And, uh, and, and we're teaching our children to tell their own stories, so we're trying to do that better. If you can't do that, you can share people telling their stories and, and share that. Uh, I think normalizing it and becoming desensitized to it is a problem. I don't really have an answer for it, but I know that um, there's a lot of stuff out there that isn't super authentic, that feels um, like a commercial in some ways. I think the more that you can make it personal to you or um, the more authentic it can be, I think that people that help that helps a little bit. I don't have any magic solution for it. You're right, and especially as more and more social media, come, more and more people are going on it and there's more of it and we're all on our technology. We're getting bombarded with all this stuff. Um, we also try to be really you know, intentional about being hopeful in our messages because it's, you know, it's so intense to constantly be bombarding people with uh, hard stuff. But uh, being real during Ebola, I was like, I don't know how to make this situation hopeful. Like there's people fighting it, but there are people dying. And uh, I did get some feedback during that time. Most of it was all positive and supportive, but there were a couple people that were like, this is really intense, like it's not right for you to post this, and, but the communities were saying, share, share, like I have a lot of followers, they're like, share with the world what's going on, we need people, and I'm, so why do I care about what someone in DC says when this person right in, around me, you know, but um, I, that's all I have. <laughs> that's all I have on that. Hi, my name's Natalie, I'm a junior here. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on volunteerism, and I know you kind of spoke in the beginning. You mentioned how you had gone to Haiti when you were younger. Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak about volunteerism and any problems and you know good things about it. I think it's so com that's another complex volunteerism. You know, we were in the beginning of the organization. We were trying to figure out how to make it sustainable, and we're like, if we can bring volunteers and they pay money, that money can go to help the schools. But it's so odd too at the same time you have these people they don't really understand the country the complexities the, I mean they speak English in Liberia they can speak the Liberian English now but by the time people come they don't it takes a long time to you know and then and then for us with our children we don't want to expose them to all these different volunteers constantly and then they come in and out um, so then Ebola happened and then we didn't have to worry about volunteerism anymore we're like that's done and moving on and it's really nice to just focus on our programs however we need money and you you know, the one, it's really, it's another interesting thing that people, all of you here, if I was like, and I do, I always tell people, come to Liberia, because I, I want people to come and see how, like, the depth of this country and the complexity, com, you know, complexities in the relationship, and I think people should come uh, and, and, and confront some of these things um, and be inspired by some of these things, so I, I, it is, it's another one of those things that I wish I had a better answer for you. I, I, I know, and I've read, there was an article that was going viral a little while ago that was, from Stanford or something somewhere that was like talking about all the white people that are going and and uh, kind of the white savior complex. They was talking about that and and there were things that I, I never responded to it, but I read it and there were good points and true points in it. But there are also things in it that were not like I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if I didn't go on that trip. To, you know the Centavia Haiti thing. Um, and so I think it's important for us to see the world and and ask questions and um, that was the way I got there. So I think that there's got to be a way for us to be able to see the world um, and, and understand what's happening. I think that through seeing things, you understand them better, you ask questions better. Um, so I, I, I would say just being more conscious of if, those, if there could be trips that people could go on, university trips, um, where people are, are more thoughtful in how, in how the whole, you know, I, when I went, I didn't really understand that there's a lot of depth and, com you know, it's, it's the complications and all of it. But, just trying to, to confront that, know about it, be aware about it, and but I still think people should go and, and see what's happening. It'd be better if they didn't go and sent the money to actual organizations doing stuff, but uh, but if I did that, let's say I didn't go and I just raised $2,000 for Haiti. One, I don't know the organizations. You know, that's that, I always struggle with that too. That's I'm, I don't know if that question will come up. Is like, where do you send it where you know the money's gonna actually help people? Um, and then two is, 
um, is just like, I wouldn't be doing, I, then I would go off, I was thinking about being a dental assistant at the time. Like, I'd be a dental assistant today instead of working with the government of Liberia to rebuild the whole education system and have 180 girls that are number one performing in, you know, outcomes in Liberia for, in central Monrovia. So I, I think there's like good at pros and cons to it. Thank I'm you. sure that's what you're finding. Is that what you're finding? Yeah, it's a lot of it. A lot of it. Have you been on a trip? I haven't, no. But I feel like there's people that love to talk and love to like criticize and hate on things and they have never participated or done anything. Like people who like to criticize the most are often people who've done the least. Like I, that's what I find. And it's so easy to hurl stones. Uh, but you know, try and go do something. If you don't like something, change it. Like develop a new way, uh, you know, that you feel better about. That's what I, that's my advice there, my thought on that. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Charlie. I'm a junior. I'm a double major in dance and anthropology. In um, what? In dance and anthropology. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so my question kind of revolves around, so um, I, I've traveled to Rwanda and Uganda, and I've done ethnographic research. I haven't worked with N NGOs. Um, and one of the biggest problems we saw was the failures of NGOs, and especially in the Organization of Invisible Children and the Kony 2012 movement. How do you continue to educate yourself and be on top of these issues? Because I feel like one of the strongest things you can do is to lessen that gap of distance and really be able to show that this organization is helping people. How do you respond to people saying that uh, th with white savior complex and um, uh, the failings of NGOs in general, especially small ones? Yeah, and I love, um I think it's not especially the strong ones or the, the small ones. I think sometimes it's even, that's what I, it's fascinating. And we do, I mean, of course, our team is majority is African, but I spend 50% of my time in the ground in Liberia. And, uh, and there is this, the white savior complex and how do we avoid it and invisible children, all that. that I like talking about it. I think we need to talk about it. Uh, there's a really great documentary. If anybody uh, is interested, it's, it's um, what it's, Poverty, poverty, what is it? Poverty Inc. That talks, and I like it so much because usually you get like two ends. You're like, oh, the white person going to save Africa, or you get the other end of like, we hate white people trying to help Africa. Like it's like one or the other, and there's actually something in the middle where you can, where there are people who can use their privilege to, to join, a, you know, join a cause or to, to advocate or to, you know, to actually make a difference. Um, and I think that that documentary showed some really great examples of, uh, of organizations that were, there was a group that went to Haiti to adopt, or family that went to go to Haiti to adopt the children. And they get there and they realize, oh, the kids are actually not orphans, they're just poor. Their families are poor and they can't afford, and this is the reality. I mean, most, or a lot of these orphanages, it, even the few that are in Liberia, there's not many because they're very anti-orphanage. Uh, the few that are there, the kids are not real orphans. The parents are just too poor to feed their kids, so they end up putting their kid in the orphanage. I'm giving an example. So then the woman goes there to adopt the kid and realizes, oh, she's got parents and a family, but they can't afford. Let's, what if we just stay here for a little while and work with the family to make the family strong enough to be able to take care of their own child? So they stayed for years, and now they start, ended up helping people start businesses, bringing a lot of money and saving a lot of kids from orphanages and being adopted and sent out elsewhere. Um, so there are people that are doing awesome work that are white that go to these nations and, and do great things. So I think um, one of the ways that we try, I, I just try to be real and authentic. That's how I do it. I'm the leader of the organization, so I end up getting, there are people who make those kind of uh, you know, statements towards me, mostly not librarians as much. Um, you know, Liberia is very supportive. I feel super supported by, it's usually people from other countries. And if I'm gonna be very, very, I like to keep, you know, I'm tell, being so honest, this is risky to say. I often find the people that are hurling those stones mostly are like the diaspora from other African countries that come from a place of privilege, often. And they're hurling it and they're not doing much about it. Like, uh-oh, Teddy doesn't think I should have said that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there's truth to it too. You know, there's so much. I see the whole like come for a day and hold a child and throw a kid in the air. And there's this Tinder white savior thing that's hysterical. and. There's truth to, to that whole thing as well. Um, I think people, if you follow my inst more than me's Instagram, that's different than my own. If you follow mine, you can see the uh, closeness that, you know, and the authenticity of, of I know the people, I speak the language, you know, I love, uh, you know. So, um, but even with that, there is no way. I mean, I think one day there probably will be some camp, I don't know if there'll be a campaign against, and uh, I know the guys who did Invisible Children, 
because it's a small circle of people. And I think part of their issue, I don't know anything about Uganda. I haven't been there. I don't know their work or if they did work. But I think part of a lot of their issue was that they were like, they were, they were oversimplifying and they were not clear about what their mission was. Like their mission to me was like advocating kind of like one campaign where you're trying to tell people what's happening to, in order to stop the, you know, to, to get this guy in jail that wants, you know, they wanted to go to jail. But people thought they were actually helping the poor and they're donating money to, and they're not helping the poor. I guess I'm gonna stop talking about invisible children. But yes, no, it's a, that is a problem. I think trying to be authentic about it, being honest, talking about it, addressing it. Um, I'm not afraid to talk about it. I, and um, and I, that's it. If you have any suggestions too, of, I mean, we're open to it uh, as well, um, to hearing more. And I think if you see any of our work, like I said, you see that we work with communities to support communities. We see, you see that we work with the president and the Ministry of Education. Um, and it's from top to bottom. It's, it's not just the top and not just the bottom. It's kind of everybody in between. We have a Liberian board that's helped a lot too. Um, when people in Liberia have any questions, they can, we have Liberians that represent us. Um, and eventually what will be ultimate is when I'm no longer uh, the face of more than me, but the kids themselves are their own spokespeople. I'm excited and looking forward to that day. Uh, our oldest girl right now is in 10th grade, so we're, that'll, that'll help too. Hi, I'm Susan Manasian, the college chaplain. In every culture, there are wise people and mentors within the indigenous cultures yeah. who teach us much. I would like for you to share, if you would, a person who is Liberian, who taught you something about uh, life, culture of the Liberian people, that is wisdom that you carry with you from them, and address how that has changed you or transformed your life beyond your work your work yeah that's a really great question i feel like that there's a lot there uh, when you were speaking the first person that came to mind was dorbo jola who is the chair of our liberian advisory board and um and it's because you know just listening to all his struggles and running and helping and he runs procurement for the country now and he ran the ebola task force and we got really close during that time and he has trust because we trust each other he's been able to share a lot of behind the scenes what how things run in the country. So to see him and everything that he goes through and all the attacks and the, against his own life and everything, to watch how he lives his life every day and that he continues in that position even though he has, he could do so many other things, um, definitely has been, I mean, it has been an inspiration. But then practically, I learned a lot of practical things from him too. There's a woman named Rosanna Shack who um, is leads something called Think Liberia, which is Abigail was found. She ended up going through Think's program and was adopted by one of their social workers. Um, and Rosanna has been a mentor to me since I moved to Liberia. I met her in 2006 when I first got there, um, and she's helped me with like even how I tell the stories of the students. And um, you know, if you, as you see, I didn't put like you know changing names or. Um, and she's practically helped me in that way of how I can be better at you know. In, is there, is there a story or uh, a uh, value or a um, something that comes out of their, the language of the community that is a foundational principle that then evokes that kind of response of these people to do the work that they're yeah, doing? Yeah, I feel like the people, like I said, like there's no one that will fight harder for the people than the people themselves. And so, I, I, I mean, the one that always comes up constantly when you talk about these places, I don't love the word, but it's, um, I don't like it because they don't have a choice in some ways, but they do, and they do and they don't, it's resilience. And I think it's like you see that these people have, many of them have lived through the war or have left and come back. Um, many of the communities after the war, they live every single day and they have no choice but to continue to keep going. Um, and I think about, I guess one of the person that embodies that the most is Principal Adams at one of the partnership schools we're working in. He's the principal who is, um, loves his community and he's like an inspiring person and he would do anything for his community but he doesn't have any financial resources. I mean, he's on government payroll so he does get paid as a teacher. Well, this, the rain in Liberia, it's one of the wettest countries in the world, ends up destroying the, the roof and the school's falling on, uh, down and it was closed. He was still trying to figure out, he was doing everything he can to get the school open anyway. 
and he went on the radio to advocate for the school. He tried to bring, it was a government school, so he was trying to get the government involved. And, uh, and, do, and, and the government just works slow. It's not that they're bad, I mean, there's, that's a complicated thing. But so he, uh, I mean, just his resilience and strength in trying to make that happen um, is, is, that shows, and that was the same thing during Ebola. People with Dr. Brown with no gloves, you know what I mean, trying to fight Ebola on the front lines um, and seeing that. I hope that I answered that the right, or maybe I didn't understand it the right way. Thank you. That's all the time we have today, but there will be a reception at New College House. Uh, Thank you.